I've made this claim before and I'll make it again. When your horror series gets into the double digits or close to it, you're going to have a couple of black sheeps. When talking about something as iconic and long lasting as Friday the 13th, there are more than a couple that fit the bill. Trust me, just look at these ranking lists. But I've always had a childhood love for the Friday movies. Jason Voorhees is one of the big three, and because of this, eh, the fan base can be a bit much. So let me clarify my stance. Jason Voorhees is my favorite, yet I've never found him scary. I don't know, I was probably around seven when I first saw these movies. And I've always, even since that young age, thought Jason was cool, his look, his attitude. He kinda had that Zed vibe from the Power Rangers, you know? Which, if you're around my age, can we just stop and admit, Kimberly was all of our first love. She has has to follow, honey, just like. But the point is, is that I've always rooted for Jason. I've said it before, I'll say it again. And never the teens. What's blood for? if not for shedding. Exactly. And so Jason Voorhees follows that path for me. I'm also not in the group that prefers a more human, a more vulnerable Jason. Final chapter and on is more my style. But I will say that uh, besides the ending, four is the start of Under Jason. You see, I want him to be unstoppable. I want my Voorhees to have an aversion to doors. <laughs> superhuman strength and constantly seething in anger. I want him to breathe with a passion and fury, even though he has no need for working lungs. But listen, I'm the guy that likes pretty much almost every entry in this series, you know, except Ghost to Hell. Murdering, thieving, cocksucker. My only issue is that some dumb kids always seem to find a way to take him down. And I wait for the day a Friday film ends, with Jason killing everyone in his way, to then wander off into the woods like Swamp Thing into the marsh. On today's episode of The Black Sheep, I'm not only openly admitting that part eight isn't bad, but it's one of my favorite entries. What the fuck are you babbling about? You bring that shit up? I want to thank you guys for watching The Black Sheep and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now back to the show. Now, by the time part eight rolled around, the popularity with this series was running a bit thin. This one was kind of seen as a goodbye chapter in a way. And they did try ending this with part four of the final chapter. So, you know, never say never. But Paramount had had its fill and, frankly, was never proud of the series anyhow. Yeah, it made them bank, but they always viewed it as beneath them. Executive producer Frank Mancuso Jr. has said that the series came with a negative connotation. People claim that its violence contributed to that of the real world. And bullshit. But for the movie itself, the one thing that gets brought up the most in terms of a negative impact is that Part 8 doesn't really take Manhattan as much as it pops in for 10 minutes to say hello. And yeah, as much as I love this entry, I can't argue that we were sold a bag of goods that was different as advertised. And this was no fault of director Rob Hedden. Paramount really liked his first draft, which included things like a chase scene across the Brooklyn Bridge, a boxing match in Madison Square Garden, and Jason on the Statue of Liberty. But as rewrites dealt with the budget concerns, and scene after scene was cut or changed, what was settled on was the last third of the movie taking place in the Big Apple. So what eventually got greenlit would end up taking place mostly on a cruise ship to New York. Of course, there's a much bigger story in these production issues, which we will get into in our upcoming episode of what the f*** happened to this horror movie. But it's good context to understand that the reason we got what we got was a cheap studio that didn't have faith in a product enough to fund it. At a quaint $5 million budget, Manhattan was the highest produced Friday movie at the time. And since this was still the 80s, the look and direction here are peak Jason. It still has that low budget feel that gives the Friday series its charm, but expands things just enough to where part eight feels appropriately bigger without losing what makes the series great. Where Jason lives exemplified that great haunted house look, this gives us the daunting claustrophobia of a ship and the angry sea along with it. 
Yeah, connecting Camp Crystal Lake to the Atlantic may seem impossible, because it is, and the cost of renting a fucking cruise ship for a high school graduation may bring up questions like, where did this level of cash come from? And isn't there a train or bus system that may be a quicker option? Director Rob Hedden makes great use of this setting, and it's maybe why, even if the lack of Manhattan is an issue, having Jason take the high seas is beyond a good time. This ship is a character here. It is both modern, with a dance floor and a sauna, yet it also feels like it came from a different era. I mean, we get a boiler room out of a Nightmare on Elm Street flick, you know, where J.J. Jarrett spends most of her short life filming a music video. We get the return of the Crazy Ralph type of character, this time an old drunk deckhand who brings back the classic Everyone here is fucked. Came down the river and he's gotten on board. He walks a ship here and now. Director Rob Hedden finds ways to utilize the ship's setting, giving us interesting shot compositions and style. The disco spin, Rennie's trip out in a room, the framing of the second in command's death, or even the chokehold through the port window. There's an all around uneasy vibe, and as the kill count rises, so it is a feeling of tension and even the camera movement. As the 80s come to an end and some random high school that not only has the class size, but money to rent a cruise ship heads out to the Big Apple. A slimy, wet, and pissed off Jason has hopped a ride to do what he does best. And the portrayal of Jason here is one of the best. I love how he's mostly filmed here. The camera is always slightly lower, giving Kane this taller, more menacing vibe. One of the best parts is early on, when Jason is once again brought back by the magic of electricity, takes his worn out hockey mask with the convenient axe mark from part 3, kills Jim Miller, then finishes off his stunning girlfriend Susie. A little something for the gentleman. Oh, and a behind the scenes blooper we also get Jason's cock, so you know, something for the ladies. Ladies, 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 ladies. But back to my point. After these two kills, he actually drives the boat to the docked cruise ship. You know, Jason just traversing the lake, taking in the scenery, on his way to kill more. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Not only does this movie sport my favorite look and one of my favorite hockey masks in the series, you know, we've got a shredded black jumpsuit, rotting and bloated flesh, covered in slime, and so pissed and wanting to kill that he swims from the cruise ship to New York. Dedication, if I've ever seen it. Also, this start in Jason Lives and continues here, an important detail, one that embodies the rage and pure evil of the character, in that you can't see his eyes. Those two holes in his hockey mask need to represent the soulless black hole that is Jason Voorhees. Blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. You can see his eyes in Freddy vs. Jason. You can see his eyes in the remake. People hate him teleporting here. Why? What, so the characters have more of a chance? Nah, that's f***ing boring. I need him to kill more. Maybe all that electricity somehow gets him around quicker. I, I don't know. Yeah, like the Flash, only more murders. Tossing a jerk out of a second story window. Thank you. Stalking pretty girls on the dance floor. Even the game made this canon. Even though the MPAA has always headed in for the Friday series, Part 8 tried to take a different approach to the kills, so that they weren't so neutered in editing. And I'm not saying they weren't cut down, but there was a conscious decision to use brute force over slicing and dicing. And the kills here are great! Flying V guitar to the face in POV form, Jason looking for that perfect piece of broken mirror, tossing that pretty boy off the modern Jacob's Ladder, the sauna, which I knew was a death trap from the very beginning. I mean, where's the cold plunge? Guys, where's the cold plunge? The neck breaking in the disco scene and that great violent toss. And of course, Julius going for broke. The boxing scene embodies why Manhattan works is such a fun sequel. Jason has the confidence and respect to let Julius give it his all. Steady, steady, wait for it. Steady. For fuck's sake, please have some fun. It leaned into what makes a Friday film great, while somehow being ridiculous, while playing everything as serious and straight as the earliest entries. 
it gives us a scene where the popular girl is afraid of getting caught with coke. Ah, uh, 80s cocaine. decides to casually murder the main goody two-shoes, you know, just in case. Rennie plays a good final girl. I mean, she even gets shot up with smack and only escapes because Jason saves the day. She then drives the getaway car into a wall, killing the only teacher and friend who treated her well. I mean, how is that not great? Manhattan gives us a fun and inventive movie that stays comfortably in the Friday formula we get cool kills, a solid lead, and a bad guy worth rooting for. The Friday series was always the sleazy and shallow answer to the Halloween series, early entries of course. And that's why I've always loved it. Listen, I love a great burger and Ball is one of the best, but you know what's just as good? Maxwell Street at 2 a.m. And like some of the best fast food, the Friday series, it may be cheap and greasy, but it has heart and hits the right spot. The Friday series has always embraced its trashy and exploitative side, and I don't want that to change. This should never be a twist on the postmodern feminist slasher. I mean, you know, because sometimes it's good to have something dumb and lowbrow. And regardless how you feel about the later sequels, can we at least admit, the Friday series has never needed to be hip with a missed place trick, trick or treat. treat. Motherfucker. Praise the Lord. The New York part may be underutilized and stripped down because of the cheapskates at Paramount, but even the most hardened purist who only likes parts one through four can admit Jason on the subway or Jason in Times Square is something else. Iconic, menacing, and all around cool. A series that has always been exactly what it needed to be and one that understands the fans better than most. And so, Let's get together and pour a little something in dedication to one of the best villains in horror history. A man who has brought us all together, friends and family. Mr. Jason Voorhees. Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.